Guys, it's going to be a blessed time right now. I guarantee it. Amen. Okay, Lord, we just pray that you would bless this sermon, Lord. I know that you want to do something in this time. I know that you want to do something in uh, us all being together. And I pray that you would open up each person's heart and their ears and their the eyes of their understanding so that they can see what you want to reveal in this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so today's sermon is titled... God's boarding house. Does everybody know what a boarding house is? Does anybody not know what a boarding house is? Raise your hand if you don't know. Okay, does somebody that knows what a boarding house is want to explain? Somebody? What is a boarding house? It's where you get sent by your parents when you're bad. No, that's... Uh, <laughs> you're thinking of boarding school. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, um, a boarding house is where a lot of people stay in, like, one house with lots of beds and bathrooms. And it's like yeah. Building. Adam, aren't you in a boarding house right now? Technically? Uh, maybe. maybe. <laughs> That's where you, re- essentially, it's where you rent a room. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's where you rent a room. So, you know, so you have like roommates. So anybody where you have like an owner of the house and you rent a room, that's, that's what boarding is. Uh, so today I'm going to be preaching a very serious sermon. I'd like to encourage everyone to, Examine your hearts and to prepare your hearts for what the Lord would want to do in this time. Um, so we just went over what a boarding house is, um, but this is the definition. So a boarding house is a house, frequently a family home, in which lodgers rent one or more rooms on a nightly basis and sometimes for extended periods of weeks, months, and years. The common parts of the house are maintained in some services such as laundry and cleaning may be supplied. They normally provide room and board, that is some meals as well as accommodation. So you might say, why did I name today's sermon God's boarding house? So we're gonna get into that in a second. Lodgers, they have right to their room, but the landlord still owns the property, right? If you rent a room, it's not your house. If you rent a room, Technically, the owner can come in and say, hey, we're going to change the paint in your home or in your room. We're going to we're going to uh, maybe, let's say, uh, change some some plumbing where when you own your home, you get to pretty much determine whatever happens. So why is today's title God's boarding house? Because very often we treat God like someone who's a boarder in our home. We treat God as though he's the one boarding a room in our home or our heart. We like the benefit of having his company at times. We like what he contributes to our lives, what he contributes to our home. But the Christian life is not a life of treating God like someone renting a room in your heart. And very often we do that to the Lord. We say, God, I love you living with me, but this is your room. This is where you got to stay. So the issue with a boarding house is that the boarders don't get a say in who the owner lets stay there. So let's say you're renting a room from somebody and all of a sudden you realize, wow, I don't like the other people living here. You don't get a say. You have people around that, that uh, maybe you fight with. Maybe they steal your food. Anybody here have any roommate experiences where you had a roommate or somebody staying with you and uh, your food disappeared? Anybody? What about family? Uh, family's a little different, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, when it's like a roommate situation, you know, you make this your favorite meal, you put it in the fridge and you put a thing that says, don't touch. And you know what happens? You go into the fridge, it gets touched and you're like, where, where did the food go? So, um, you know, not only that, but, uh, you know, an example of a boarding room could almost be like a dormitory. You know, when you're at a dorm, people can be playing music above you. And you don't, I mean, you can come and and say like, you got to turn the music down, but you don't have the authority like the the dorm supervisor would have to say, you got to turn it down. Um, And so I'm sure people here have had different experiences with roommates or maybe no one here has really had the experience of being in a boarding home. Um, But we're going to deal with spiritual things. So I'd like to use this analogy of our heart being like a boarding home or a boarding uh, place throughout the sermon. So when we maintain 
ownership of our home, which I'm saying our heart, we very often, well, actually, you're guaranteed to treat God just like a guest. So if you, in your heart, have ownership of your heart, you're going to treat God like one of your guests. When you have guests over, and actually, when we have guests over, some people have been to our home, there are places we don't give access to. Not because there's anything crazy valuable, but it's like, you know, you don't tell people, hey, go hang out in, uh, on our bed. Go ahead, eat, eat your meal on our bed. No, it's like, you eat, because you're a guest, you have to stay here. Now, when Tess and I, if we want to take a snack to our bedroom, we, we're like, we, we can do that because we're the ones that control the home. Um, when people come to our home, we don't say, uh, hey, just touch whatever you want, take whatever you want, throw away whatever you want, uh, change and decorate however you want, right? Who, who here has that kind of accessibility that they give people when they come into your space? Nobody. Nobody. You don't, people often don't, want, don't even want the suggestion, hey, you could change that or, or uh, you could move that or put this here. When people you know, decorate their home a certain way, they don't like it when people give them tips. Uh, now, I'm not saying it's wrong to give people tips. I'm just saying, you know, that's a normal thing, right? People feel like, oh, you're criticizing me. You don't like my sense of style. So when we're in ownership of our heart, our home, we have the final say. Um, Barbara, can you not do the ice during the, the time? Um, we have the final say. So this is what being an owner of a home affords you the ability to do. Now, the issue is that God is not looking to just be a guest or a boarder in your heart. He is looking to be the owner. So think of this as we're going to go over this. Now, the danger of us maintaining ownership is that here's the biggest danger. Can anybody? Okay, I'm going to ask people. What do you think is the biggest danger of us maintaining ownership of our heart? We think we can just do whatever we want. That's, that's a, yeah, that's a good one. Um, who we let in. Who we let in. That's a big one, yeah. We're like leaning into our own thoughts instead of like what Jesus and God has. Leaning into our own thoughts instead of what Jesus wants us to. <laughs> so I'm going to say the, the greatest danger because when you're dealing with danger, you're not just dealing with mistake. You're dealing with something that's threatening. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, it can be, you know, if you're walking in a place where the gravel kind of is shifty, that's not so much as dangerous as much as you ha can't be careless. But if you're dealing with a person that wants to destroy you, that's a danger. So when God is not the owner of our life or our home, the problem can be that we actually give place to both God and Satan. When you give place to both God and Satan, you're giving place to the father of lies. And not only that, but a cartel of demons that are always looking for a home that has vacancy. So demons want to find a vacant place. Anyone ever uh, travel and go to a hotel and, and see a uh, no, no vacancy sign? You know, it means there's no rooms available. Um, whenever you travel and you are, end up in a place where all of a sudden the hotels are all booked, that's kind of, it's, a, it's not frightening, but it's a little burdensome. You end up going from hotel to hotel to hotel, and it's like, really? Like, they're booked up here, they're booked up here. Now, Satan is always looking for a place of vacancy, so it would be extremely dangerous to give any place to the devil. Now, for this border analogy, I'm going to kind of bring it into just physical terms that we can deal with. Imagine you have a home and all of a sudden some gang members come and say, hey, could we rent a room? Can we, we got the money, we'll, we'll pay for a room in your home. And you know, you see the money and you're like, uh, it's not that bad, I still have ownership. Let's say some prostitutes come and say, hey, could we have, uh, could we rent a room? Could, or a thief comes and says, can I rent a room? Or a murderer comes and you know, you end up having all these different types of people staying in your home. When God doesn't have ownership, you know, the devil will always find a way to get his kingdom established in your home, in your heart. So if God does not have ownership, God can have a room in your home. You can give God a room in your home. And we're going to go into that in a second because you think, surely God is not going to dwell with evil. Surely God's not going to even be around wickedness. And it's a complicated thing uh, in understanding that because there's components where God will not mix, but there's components where God will make appeal 
to us, even if we're not giving him ownership. So the danger of, not, of us maintaining ownership is that we'll both let God and Satan stay in the same home. So the mind of God is infinitely complex, and I don't know why he does what he does. I don't know why um, there's a place where he's wholly beyond measure, um, in, but the truth is in this life, he's created a middle space where light and dark are, are wrestling, where good and evil are wrestling, where God and the devil have opportunity to buy for control over individuals. So it's not like God is totally absent from most people's lives, even when they, they don't give God ownership. God can't actually be there. So the truth is that God can dominate Satan and overcome him very easily at any time. But we see that something is unfolding in our reality of life concerning this, concerning choices, like the choice to submit to God. So God could, he could come in and overpower any of us. He could literally say, you know what? I'm busting in like the SWAT team. I'm kicking the devil out. I'm kicking things out. You don't own this home anymore. It belongs to me. But very, very often there's this like wrestling match where God lets us have to go through the consequences for not giving him ownership, where he's there speaking to us and we're saying, God, I'm not going to listen. I'm going to do, do it my way. I'm going to go my way. Or where you say, Yes, Lord, I, I, I surrender to you. I'm going to make a choice to give you full ownership and sh throw everything out of my life that needs to be thrown out. So here's one thing. The best example of this is Judas. Let's go to Luke 9, 1 and 2. Luke 9, 1 and 2. So the, the reason why this is a perfect example to help you understand that God can have place in someone's life and the devil can have place in someone's life is because it says in Luke 9, 1, and he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Was Judas present? So, you know, sometimes we maybe think like Jesus says, Judas, like you hang out here for a minute. Okay, 11, here you are. I give you power to heal the sick and to cast out demons. But no, Judas, the person that betrayed Jesus, literally was called and said, I give you power and authority over demons and to cure diseases. Let's go to John 13, 21 through 28. So if you can follow with me, and if anyone's tired, if anyone can just let the Lord give them some life and energy, I promise you, will bless you. And if that, maybe that back door needs to be open just because when we have 30 people in a room or 32 people in a room this small, oxygen, yeah, dissipates and carbon dioxide causes your brain to go to sleep. That's <laughs> Air conditioning yes, without, yeah. yeah. So nice. Okay, there we go. Got to get some, some air in. Yeah, I know. I'm serious. When you have this, it's a real thing. I once, this is a total tangent, but I once called an air conditioning company because I was looking to, to maybe rent some property. And they were like, how many bodies are you going to have? We got to figure out your air conditioning. And I was like, I don't know. Do we really need that kind of air conditioning for that many people? The guy's like, each person's a battery. And each person is uh, producing heat <laughs> in a room. Okay, so John 13, 21. Who'd like to read 21 through 25? Okay, Wenny. Now? Yeah. John chapter 13, verse 21. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord. Who is it? Verse 25. Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, 
what you're going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Jesus had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, or I said Jesus. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. So this is an example of somebody that God had place in his heart, God had place in his life, but he didn't have God owning every part of his heart. Satan could come and enter as he chose. And it's very interesting because later on in John 14, we're not going to turn there, but what happens is Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he said, it's kind of like you see this uh, contrast. Satan comes to Judas he has claim in Judas's heart and nobody knew, but Jesus actually is saying, hey, the prince of this world, the ruler of this world has come and he has no place in me and he has no authority in me. So when God has ownership of our life, Satan has no authority in our life. But if God doesn't have ownership of your life, if he doesn't have ownership of your heart, the truth is Satan has authority and he can come and go as he chooses. See, there is a place where God can be very present in someone's life and the devil can be very present as well. But until God has full ownership, all bets are off concerning the destination and the destiny of the individual soul. You can be very close to Jesus, but if Jesus does not own your heart, if he does not have full ownership, being close proximity, it doesn't help. Just like if you needed antibiotics, you could put the antibiotics on your skin. Um, you could go to bed with them under your pillow, but if you need to ingest them, they need to become part of you in the same way God must come into our life and take ownership. So the problem is that we aren't in as con much control as we think when we don't give God ownership of our heart and over every room of our life. Let's go to Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And then could somebody read it for us? Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So what this is saying is that all of us are dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses spiritually, under Satan's authority and power. There is not one person that is too smart for the devil. When the devil comes knocking on the door, we give them the entire home thinking that we're still in control. That's the biggest lie. The devil makes people think they have control. But in reality, the moment he enters your home, if Jesus isn't there to kick him out and to push him out and to say, this is my home, you already lost the battle. The moment you give the devil a foot into your life, you've lost the battle. And that is all of us. Every single one of us at one point or time lost the battle. That's the point of salvation, redemption. You don't need to redeem something that has... Um, value. You, you need to redeem something that is at a loss. You don't need to redeem something that's free. You need to redeem something that's in slavery or someone in slavery. So we all once upon a time were just in disobedience. So that meant that we, and maybe today you have to examine your hearts. Are there places of disobedience? If so, what will it take for God to have ownership over the areas of disobedience? When you don't give God ownership, the truth is you will rent out rooms to demons. It is inevitable. If you do not have God having ownership of your life, you will give place to demons in your life. It is inevitable. And all the while, you will think that everything's okay because God has a room in your heart. You see, we, we're crafty. We're tricky. We say, God, I'm going to keep control. going to give you this portion of my life. going to give this, whatever th this demon is offering, this part of my life. And uh, hopefully, you know, it'll all work out. And it doesn't all work out. You can think that you're, everything is okay because God has a room in your heart. And any place you give to God, guess what? He will be there. God is that good. 
God, any play, even if you're not surrendered to God, God will come and he'll say, hey, I'll begin to work in this part of your life. I'll begin to be a voice of truth. The Holy Spirit will begin to bring conviction, even if you're not at the place of full ownership. God is not scared of our sin. God is not overcome by our sin. God hates sin, but he also loves us. And so in however the Holy Spirit does it, God can literally be speaking to us even while we don't give him ownership of our life. God can be in our lives, but he doesn't have full ownership. So God will be there. He'll be working. He'll be reasoning with your heart. How many people here before they were saved remember when God was even reasoning in their heart saying, don't do this. Don't do that. It's going to have bad consequences. It's going to mess up your life. Don't, don't be with that person. Don't hang out with that person. Don't go to that party. Don't go here. You know, what, you ever hear those stories? Even when people don't give their life to Christ yet, or hopefully someday they do, they're like, oh man, you know, I'm, I'm not ready to give my life to Christ. But there was this one time where I was going to go to a party and something told me not to do it. And then something bad happened. You know, there are these stories all the time. There was a guy in college that I, I knew. He was not saved. He had not given God control of his life. He got shot in the back because he went to a party. Somebody thought he was somebody else. And so they shot him because they thought he, you know, they thought that if, if he was being totally honest. Now, that's the ultimate question. But he was being, he told me he was being honest. But he said, man, I felt like a, a pit in my stomach telling me not to go to the party that night. That's, I mean, the devil's not telling somebody not to go somewhere where they're going to experience death or destruction. So even though God ha- did not have ownership of this person's life, This person had God speak to him, but he didn't listen. So God will be there working, reasoning with your heart, speaking the truth to you. But at the end of the day, you're faced with the choice of who you will give control to. So I'm going to talk today about some of the borders of of the heart if God doesn't have control. If God just has a room, this is going to be who else is in your home. Shame. Shame will be in your home. Shame has a way of getting you to look at yourself. Shame is supposed to get us to look at at what we've done to violate God's commands, but so often shame has us look into ourself. So if shame is in your home, it's going to lie to you. It'll tell you that God's not big enough to cover it. It'll tell you that you got to try to fix the problems on your own apart from God. Who here has ever had that voice tell them, oh, you got to try to fix the problem apart from God? You know, fear will have place in your home. Fear will get you afraid. Fear will get you so afraid that even when bad things are happening in your life, you'll be paralyzed. Has anyone here ever uh, been driving and had a deer in front of them? It's not common in Tucson, but anywhere else? North Carolina has a lot of deers because we were there. That's why. We have, you know, uh, Virginia has a lot of deer. Pennsylvania has a lot of deer. You know, when you're driving, the deer just looks at you. It's like there's a big 2,000, 3,000 pound car that would destroy this deer and it just has a way of being paralyzed. That's why the expression, you know, don't be like a deer in headlights. So fear will get you to to see the problems around you and you'll be too paralyzed to even do anything about it. Self-deception can be a border in your home. Self-deception, this is a bad one. It'll get you to see how how things aren't. It'll get you to see how, <laughs> you know, it'll get you, see, <laughs> that sounds funny, but self-deception will literally get you seeing how things are not. It'll get you thinking, hoping that maybe things are that aren't and things that are, you know, it just gets all mixed up. So it'll keep you from seeing how bad things really are. And if it fails to keep you from seeing how bad things really are, it'll come up with every single lie with your own voice speaking to you as to why the truth is not the truth or why the solution in front of you is not the solution. The truth will literally be right in front of you. Solution will, and the solution will be right in front of your eyes. Self-deception will have you thinking like, no, that can't be it. It's too simple. The fire extinguisher can't really be what it's for. It's not really there to put out fires. Or 911 won't really get me in touch with the police. They'll probably make things worse. I need these people out of my house that are dealing drugs and destroying my home. No. Probably it's just, uh, it's just not, yeah, something I have to live with. Another big border in, in people's homes, pride. Pride will get you to boast in things that don't matter and have no eternal value. Everyone is tempted at times to boast in things that don't matter. 
Certain things do not matter. You know, this is a little silly one, but I once knew a guy, I, I had some friends and their younger brother. Uh, anyone here ever play uh, Mario Kart? On, oh, yeah. yeah, this this guy was, he was trying to beat the world, he was like doing world records for some of the races. That, that was like a thing apparently, you know, where he would go through the same map. It's like, man, I'm hanging out with his brother and it's like, wow, he just keeps going over and over. And he finally actually got a world record. I mean, he got one of the maps the fastest, but it's like, Think of all the hours, maybe the hundreds of hours. What's it going to amount to in eternity? Now the same thing can apply with money, right? People get big money. What's it going to amount in eternity? People can uh, move forward in a career. What's it going to amount to in, in eternity unless it's where God has called you to go? It doesn't really have eternal value. Pride will cause you to think that you're stronger than you are and more able than you are when in reality you have nothing to stand on and are close to falling into a pit or snare. We were talking to a young, young guy at Winter Haven. This guy was 17. You know, young people often can have pride. I said, hey, if you were to jump off of, um, jump off of that building or that house over there, what do you think would happen? He's like, oh, I don't think anything would happen. Yeah, you know, even at 17, jumping straight off of a building will probably really hurt you. And I said, what, what about when you're older? Um, he's like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll gain resistance, like, like, as though, like as though it's uh, like a cold that you can learn to overcome. So, you know, pride will get people not think, it will go, pride will get people thinking that they're stronger than they really are. And it will get people thinking they have something to stand on when they're very close to falling into a pit. The Bible says pride goes before destruction. When you're proud, guess what? You're one step away or a couple steps away from destruction. So narcissism can be a border in, in the heart. It will get you so focused on self that you won't pay attention to how your actions affect anybody. Amen. It will cause you to be so self-focused that you won't even see how your, affection, your actions affect other people. You know, it will cause everything to just revolve around you. Lust. You know, the Bible says in 1 John that the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life have no place, you know, in a Christian's life because they come not from God, but from the world. The lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh come not from the Father, but from the world. So lust will get you going after that which will kill you. And I'm sure everybody here has had that experience. Lust will get you, and lust does not just have to do with sex. Lust does not just have to do with, you know, visual of like the opposite sex. Lust can be lust for money. You know, people lust after money, and you know what? It destroys their family. People lust after things. They sacrifice their health just to get things. You know, lust will literally cause you to go after things that will kill you if you get them. Telling you that if you get your desires, you'll be satisfied, when in reality, getting what lust is telling you to go after will kill you. Going after lust is like putting your hand in a snake jar filled with vipers, looking for a gold coin that isn't there. Now, everybody, does anybody here love snakes? Okay, great. So some people love snakes. You know, some people have them as pets. I think snakes, I mean, out in the wild, I'm like, you know what? I'm not like creeped out by them. But when people have snakes, you know, as pets, I do, it's just a little, I think it's odd. You got to feed it, live animals to them and stuff. And I, I just, you know, you have a cat, you get to feed it kibble or meow mix or whatever, whatever you feed them. Um, but so the issue is snakes are, snakes, a snake bite can kill you. You know, it's not even the poison that kills you, it's your body's reaction to the poison. It's, I know that can sound silly, but it's like there's, well, venom, excuse me, venom. Because, you know, so you, you have something poisonous and that can literally cause your body to, to shut down. Um, there are toxins in the venom that cause your body to paralyze. And so it's, it's less as a, you know, very pe often people that die of a snake bite, it's because they can't breathe or something like that. It's not because the poison makes its way to their brain and they just, you know, suddenly die or the venom, excuse me, I keep using them. You know, unless you're a zoo person, probably everybody does the same thing, poison, venom. But the point is you put your hand into a snake jar and you're like looking for a gold coin and you know what's going to happen if you put your hand into a snake jar? You're going to get bit and it will kill you. And you know what? The longer a snake is connected to you while it's biting you, the more venom it pumps into you. And that's the danger with lust. You know, people, people think like, 
oh, you know, plus it's not that bad. Yeah, but when it's in your life for a year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years, man, that, that really will mess you up. It's hard to come back the longer lust has, has a place in you. Now, God is a redeemer. God is a restorer. But one other border will be apathy. Another word for apathy is laziness. Laziness or apathy may let you see the problems in your life, but it will convince you that there is nothing really more to do and that all your attempts are futile. Who here ever feels like there's a voice saying, oh, you know what? Don't do anything about that problem. You're not going to be able to change it anyways. Yeah, that's, that's something in, taking room in your heart that's not a God. God wants to kick that out. Hatred. Hatred will consume your mind and get your heart in such a state that you can't be reasoned with. And a lot of people deal with hatred when they don't think they deal with hatred. You ask anybody, are you consumed by hatred? Some people are honest. They say, yeah. A lot of people have hatred in their heart. Hatred has a place in their heart. And I'm not talking about godly hatred of evil or wickedness or horrendous, horrible things in our world or about your own sin. I'm talking about hatred towards other people. Now, the last border, rebellion. It'll have you seeing the right choice, but still convince you that you know better. Rebellion will always cause you to to make you think that you know better. So when God is just a border in your house, you will rent out your rooms to many different things. And all of these different things are demonic, dangerous, and deceptive things. You know, not just the ones I listed. Everybody might have their own unique list that the, that the devil has one time maybe had in your life. And hopefully today, if there's any place where he's claiming right to your heart or parts of your heart, God will be able to reason with you to give him, God, total control. So the truth is that while you're still in bondage to sin, you may not always like things the way they are, but you also enjoy the company. And that's the hard thing you have to realize. When God is just a border in your home, you like the company of, other, of these other things. And God says that has to change. If you're in bondage to sin, sometimes you might say, I don't like the way things are. But the devil will g- convince you, oh, but you like the company. You know, who here has ever had someone stay with them that was not a good thing? Anyone here ever have that happen? Now, people could share, man, yeah, we could even... You know, Angel had like somebody, or d- before she came to Christ, she had two, can I share it? Yeah. Homosexual men staying with her in her apartment. She lost her job, so she became dependent on the one that she let stay with her after he lost his job, and he was supposed to pay the electric bill, and you know what happened? One day, him and his guy, they, they leave the apartment, Angel gets a thing from the electric company, $3,000 bill. The, the, the bill wasn't paid. We're going to shut your electricity off. Now, God moved and, there, you know, God moved some things. Yeah, so the electricity did not, did not go off. Her food didn't go bad. But that's a bad roommate situation. <laughs> you know, Andrew had a roommate that was totally addicted to, uh, to alcohol. So much so, did you, you remove the battery from his car and he found it? Or... Oh, you remember, he, you said you would remove the battery from his car so he couldn't drive drunk. Oh, that's, I think, I, yeah, or maybe he took the keys or something. Yeah, I think it was the battery. I think it was the battery. <laughs> yeah. Um, some things you want to forget, you know. <laughs> I'm sure other people here have had borders in your home where you're like, oh, this is not good. I don't like this. Um, so... You know, there was once upon a time a, a woman that I knew who, back when I started off doing ministry, we were doing like a Wednesday night Bible study and um, people started coming and somebody needed someone to stay with. And it was a woman with, uh, I don't think she had any children, but she stayed with this woman that was opening up her home. And you know what happened? It was like the woman whose home it was, it was as though she wasn't the owner anymore. Like all of a sudden, you know, oh, okay, I agree to this and that. Okay, I agree here to this and that. And it's like the woman just kept doing whatever she wanted that was staying with um, in the home that wasn't hers. And then her boyfriend starts, co- or her husband, boyfriend, you know, starts coming over. And um, the, the woman says, hey, I thought you needed a place to stay because you're having problems with your, your boyfriend. Uh, 
And then not only that, but then all of a sudden the woman's mom came and stayed. And she said, you know, this girl, this woman, she's like, she was a newer believer at the time. I didn't even know that this was happening. I thought, oh, it's just like she's letting somebody stay with her. It's a very Christian thing to do. It's like the boyfriend's coming over sometimes. They're smoking marijuana. And then it's like the mom is staying there and being super controlling <laughs> over the house, even over the woman's own daughter. So Did she, she randomly get termites in that part of the house where they were staying too? Yes, yeah, something really weird started happening. Yeah, termites in that part of the house too. You know, it was a mess. So it, even though this woman, it was her home, it was as though... She didn't have ownership of her home. You know, think of that. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. So, here's the thing. No, no, no. I, I, got, I got involved once I knew how, like after a month, she was like, things are bad here. I'm like, you never said the past month that anything was bad. You didn't say that the mother was saying, you didn't say this, you didn't say this, you didn't say that. So, long story short, um, you know, it was brought under control. It was brought under control, but that's just an example of having the wrong people stay with you. She, she lost authority in her own home, which is crazy to think. She felt like, oh, like I can't, I'm being mean. You know, the devil will be there reasoning with you in those situations. Oh, I'm being mean. I can't put my foot down. I'm just being a good Christian. Let yourself get walked all over. So who here, um, has ever, now I don't know if there's anybody here, but had somebody stay with them and you couldn't get the person to leave. Who here has had a love-hate relationship with a roommate? It's like you hate the person, but you love them, kind of. You hate them, you kind of love them. Someone that you knew uh, was having a destructive influence in your life. You know, maybe you had a roommate that was having a destructive influence in your life, but you didn't think you could make the break. In the same way, our hearts go through the same things with all of these things I'm mentioning Shame, fear, apathy, self-deception. So there are things in people's hearts that must leave. They must vacate if God is going to take full ownership. There are things in your life that will have to vacate. The word vacate, if you ever have a police officer or a sheriff come to your home that says you have to vacate, that's a serious thing. They're about to kick you out of your home. If the police show up, you know, that's the crazy thing. The police can literally kick you out of your own home. If they have, you know, cause to do so, or if you're delinquent on taxes or different things uh, that can happen, you know, county taxes, housing taxes, uh, taxes. So the issue with va vacating is that God will say there are things that have to vacate and he will cause them to vacate. The things that you can't get to vacate from your home, you give ownership to God, he'll come with all authority. He'll come with all the power. The Christian life is not one of us giving God part of our heart or part of our life, it's full ownership of our life. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Who'd like to read that for us? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Um, Lauren, and then you can do the next one, Shana. So 19 through 20? Yeah. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So the Christian life is one where God owns our life. So the Holy Spirit, he's the one that dwells in us. And we are not our own. So that's the challenge. The Christian life, if you want to live a Christian life, you're not living your own life. You're living a life where God is in control. If you want to live a life where you are your own authority, you cannot be a Christian because the Holy Spirit will come and he will demand full ownership. So we've all given place to Satan and demons, you know, in our life uh, before Christ. And it's more serious than we understand. When you have the wrong people living in your home, they mess everything up. You know, you can think the house is still yours, but if you get 10 people in your house that are stronger than you, even five people that have weapons, and if they're smarter than you, your house just became their house. It's the truth. Their house, your house just became their house. Um, so sure, maybe they give you a level of freedom, but when your freedom crosses their desire, they make sure that they have their way. And that's what the devil does in people's lives. He gives them a lot of freedom. Demonic spirits will give people a sense of freedom. Oh, you have freedom. You have freedom. Yeah, but the moment your freedom crosses what the devil 
says in your life has to be, man, the, the, the snare is pulled, the yoke is put on, the chains are in place. So imagine this, like to bring it into practicality, imagine you have five heavily armed gang members. You welcome them into your home to stay with you. They begin dealing drugs from your home. You know, you're like, ah, oh, I don't really like this, but they pay rent, so okay. And they're paying extra rent too, so I'm getting a little extra, this is, this is good. They begin renting out prostitutes, you know, from your home and you're like, I don't really feel that comfortable about this. Uh, you can't overcome them or stop them because I mean, you're just by yourself, it's just you, there's five of them. They begin trashing your home. They begin convincing you that you should participate in their actions. The devil will actually get you convinced that you should begin to participate in what he wants you to participate in in your life. So this is the danger. Now all the while, maybe somewhere in your heart, you're soft to the Lord, and the Lord's there in the midst of it, watching, speaking, telling you the truth. Just say the word, I'll get them to leave. Just say the word, I'll change everything. I'll fix everything. Just say the word, just, just give me total control. So let's go to 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. Shana, would you like to read that for us when you get to it? Yeah. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless convict received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So God can redeem our messed up situations. God can redeem the places in our heart where we have given occupancy or boarding to the wrong spirits or to the wrong things. God can do that. But we have to understand that it comes through his blood. It costs a sacrifice. Jesus had to pay the fine, pay the debt that separates us from God. It says in Revelation 5, 9, and while we go there, uh, I'll just, you know, expound on 1 Peter, that the blood of Jesus Christ, who is without blemish or spot. So it's literally like as though God takes on the wreck, the mess of our life. When he had a perfect, spotless, clean home, it's like God trades it. He says, I'll give you my perfect home for your messed up home. Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you are slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God. For, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You see, there's this idea of ransom in the Bible. Now, it's not like God has to pay the devil's ransom, but there's this component of like God ransom, ransoming us, buying us, buying us out of the mess, buying us out of our, our past, buying us out of our captivity, out of our slavery. So it's not so much like that God is giving the devil something, like that God owes the devil something. It's more like this idea of ransom is that God is literally purchasing us out of our mess that we've gotten into. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. This theme is all, all throughout there. So if today God is speaking to your heart about areas where he has lack of ownership, if there's things boarding in your, in your heart, in your home that are not of God, understand that God can solve this today. In him, we have redemption through his blood. Redemption. So it doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your mess. Jesus can redeem it. Through his blood, what he did for us on the cross, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Forgiveness means the, the slate gets washed clean. Doesn't matter how bad it's been. Doesn't matter what you've done. God gives you a fresh start. According to the riches of his grace. So it doesn't come through our efforts. It doesn't come through us making the right cho choices other than the one right choice of giving God ownership. It's not like God says, now fix the house and then I'll come and redeem it. No, it's grace. He does it freely. He does it. He offers it freely, which he lavished upon us. He threw it upon us. Anyone here ever lavish someone? Do you know, everyone here would know what the word lavish means to go above and beyond. You know, when people date, Sometimes, you know, somebody lavishes the other person, like they buy too many gifts. It's like, oh, 
I didn't need like 20 things. I just wanted like three things. Or when you lavish your children, you know, it means that you're like loving them. You're showing them so much love. Um, so when it says that God lavish, it means that he, he doesn't hold back. He lavished upon us grace and all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on the earth. So our life, when we're not giving God ownership, needs to be united to him. And that means giving him ownership. Hebrews 9.12. Hebrews 9.12. Hebrews 9.12, it says, I'll wait for just a second. Hebrews 9.12. Hebrews 9.12. He entered, meaning Jesus, for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So when you give God ownership of your house, guess what? No one can take the deed of the house. You can't even take the deed back. God owns the house. He entered into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, which was Old Covenant, Old Testament, what they had to do to seek to cover their sins in obedience and faith, but by means of his own blood, God came into the mess of this world and did it himself, thus securing an eternal redemption. What God does, he does not do halfway. What God does, he does not fail to complete. So this is why ownership is important. You give God ownership of your house, your house, your life, your heart will be redeemed. So let's say that you do somehow get a tenant out of your heart, even without giving God ownership. It's possible. It's possible to get some of these tenants down at times. Um, maybe some people come and they, you have some friends that say, we got to get this thing out of your life. We got to get it out. Maybe they pray for you. Maybe they cast the spirit out of you. Maybe a demon leaves. If God doesn't have ownership of your heart, Matthew 12, 43 through 44 can happen. And let's go to Matthew 12, 43 through 44. This is a serious thing. You see, the physical world does convey Spiritual realities. I'm not saying 100% of the time, but it conveys spiritual realities. Who'd like to read Matthew 12, 43 through 44 for us today? Okay, Lucy. All right, excuse me, read 45 as well. So 12, 43 through 45. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. So when you give God ownership, it's not like your old tenants just give up trying to come back. You know, anyone here ever have an experience where you try to end a relationship or you try even, you know, and it's like somehow things just keep coming back. Um, Demons are like exes that are begging to get back into your life. I don't know if anyone here has ever had that experience, but you know, or somebody's just begging, please let me in. Or, or not only that, but people that used to uh, use you or manipulate you, which can even be different than, than an ex. You know, sometimes there are employers that are like, oh man, I could just totally like use this person. They didn't care. Like, please come back and work here. You know, I'll raise you, I'll give you a 50 cent raise. Because in their mind, they're like, hey, the 50 cent raise is worth like the $50 an hour of burden I put on them. Um, and I'm sure people here have maybe had experiences like that where you feel used or, or mistreated by an employer or even a friendship. You know, there are friendships where it's like all of a sudden the person is just begging to get back. You're like, man, I don't think this person cares about me. All they ever want to do is dump their problems on me. I give them good advice and they do the exact opposite. I, anyone here ever have those kind of relationships? Yeah. So... Those people try to get back into your life. So in the same way, if, if you have tenants in your life that are kicked out, 
what will end up happening is they'll try to make their way back. So you can be, you can be owned by God and it still doesn't mean that Satan won't try to trespass. And it just means, I guess you could say that God isn't going to allow unwanted tenants for very long. So I'll give you this example. You give God full ownership. He totally kicks things out of your life. You know what can happen? Sometimes things can come knocking on the door. Come on, let me in to hang out. And you know what? People can actually give place for something to hang out into their life. But God will come in, in power, at the appointed time, after you should have technically known better, and he'll say, okay, hey, get out of my house. You're not welcome here. And so you've given God ownership. You can't be like, God, please. You know, I know this person did me wrong in the past. I know this spirit did me wrong in the past, but maybe this time they're offering me something better. No, God's going to say, hey, out of my house and you've already given God ownership. So it's an important thing to understand that you can be owned by God and it doesn't mean that Satan won't try to trespass in your life. Um, The devil will try to woo you to let him back in. He'll try to woo your mind with deceptive lies. Anyone here ever get free from a sin? And then all of a sudden things start speaking to your mind saying, come on. It's not as bad as you thought. It's not as bad as your experience. I know you got burnt really bad last time, but maybe this time your skin is just a little tougher. You know, maybe it won't burn as bad this time. No, the truth is a burn is a burn. It's a burn and a burn is dangerous. And anything pertaining to Satan and demons is more dangerous because the fire, the fire doesn't burn you because it wants to. The fire burns you because you're careless. Satan burns you because he wants to. When you deal with an enemy, it's totally different than dealing with just force of nature, let's say, like fire. Put your hand in the fire. The fire didn't mean to do it. I mean, it's just doing its thing. It's just burning. You put your hand in the fire that's on you. But now you hang out with the wrong person. You hang out with somebody that's deadly, that's hateful, and they bring destruction into your life. That's a totally different thing. And so demonic Anything pertaining to the demonic, anything that wants to have access or ownership to your heart that's not of God, it's serious. So when your heart is wrecked by sin and Satan, the key is surrendering ownership to God. He will come in, he will redeem, he will fix. Let's go to Romans 6.4. Romans 6.4. The Bible says that God will literally put our old life to death. That means that what once had ownership in your life will never have ownership again when you come to him. Doesn't mean that it won't try to mess with you. Doesn't mean that it won't try to speak to you. You know, people come to Christ and the demons of their past still try to speak to them, try to tell them lies. You're not forgiven. You're not saved. You know, uh, go back to this, go back to that. But when God has ownership of your life, it's not going to happen. You may be in a wrestling match with something harassing you, but it will never have ownership of your life again. Romans 6, 4, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Death is a final thing in this world. Giving God ownership is a final thing. When you give Jesus Christ ownership of your heart, it is a final thing. He wants you to associate with his death his burial, his resurrection. That means the old life, the old house, God comes in, says, you know what? I take ownership and he brings a new everything into your present because it says that we too might walk in newness of life. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. We have a couple more passages. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and now think of this, salvation. You know, if you were, I I don't think anybody here has ever been held hostage. Am I wrong? Has anyone here ever been held hostage? Like in a situation where somebody had a gun or a knife or they're like, you try to leave, we're going to kill you. I'm just curious. I mean, it's not a normal thing, but that would be a very serious, that would probably be pretty scary. You know, we see it in the movies all the time. Or I mean... And like as a theme, right? A lot of the movies, it's always like, oh, hostages. Man, when, when somebody has power over you, life and death, salvation is you getting free from that. So it says the gospel of your salvation. When the devil has ownership in your life, 
Because you have not given ownership to God, salvation is you giving ownership to God. And believed in him, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So sealed. So now what God does is he comes and he marks your life. He says, your life belongs to me. Property of God. Property of Jesus Christ. Property of Yahweh. Property of the Lord. And so... Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So when demons start coming into your life, they knock on the door and they say, hey, I'm here. Now, you can actually give place to something that's not of God. You can give place to a demon. You can be like, oh, this old enemy friend of mine is back. Um, I don't know what to do. I'm a little scared. They're saying they have right here. And sometimes demons will say, we have right to your home. Let us in. And you'll be like, oh no. I know, that, I know that God marked my house and it says property of God here, but maybe, maybe God's not as good as he said, or maybe, maybe God's not as faithful as he said. And you'll end up opening the door, but you know, God's honest truth is at some point the Holy Spirit comes and opens your eyes and you say, what am I thinking? How did I fall for that lie again? Why am I letting these things into my life? Why am I letting these lies here? Why am I letting these demons speak to me? And then you, you look at the thing and you say, hey, guess what? You lying, deceiving spirit, it says property of God, property of Jesus Christ. You got to leave. And if you put your foot down, it has to leave because you have the power and authority of God. And you know what? The real thing is sometimes we don't even call out to God. You know, you say, God, this thing won't leave. And God says, do you believe that I own your home? Say, yes, Lord. Okay, I'll deal with it. It has to leave. Push it out. So the promise of the Holy Spirit, guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Titus 2.5. Titus 2.5. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Now, I know every single person here, maybe you've gone through messy phases in your home. Maybe you have a messy house today. Everybody likes a clean home. I can't think of anybody that would prefer a messy home rather than a clean home. Women love a clean home. So anybody that wants to ever get married that's a male in here, just realize, Women love clean, clean homes, and women wants a clean home. If you're a woman in here and you believe it, say amen. amen. Yeah. Okay. So, purity, pure, the idea of cleanness, purity, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, his own possession, so God does the possessing, who are zealous for good works. So, to conclude our time today, Ultimately, God's will is for our home to become his home. And when we once rented out rooms to the wrong tenants, you know what the Lord will do? He'll begin to rent out rooms to the right tenants. And you may say, the right tenants, what does that mean? Well, when you have rooms filled by God and these demons from your past and different things come knocking on the door, you have some backup. So let's go to Galatians 5, 19 through 24. What was the last reference? It wasn't Titus 2.5. Yeah, uh, did I say 2.14? Oh, Titus okay. 2.4. What did I say? Titus 2.5? Uh, I don't know why I said 2.5. Galatians 5.19 through 24. So Titus 2.14 said, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Amen. So Galatians 5.19, it says, now the works of the flesh are evident. So you don't want to have any of these tenants, okay? You don't want this to be in your home. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You can't have those things living in your life and have God have ownership of your home, your heart. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So when the Lord puts those re residents in your home, you'll have a lot easier time not giving place to the enemy. 
The Bible commands us in Ephesians 4.27 to give no foothold to the devil, no occupancy, no place. The way we do that is by giving God ownership and allowing him to place what he wants in our home. What does he want in our home? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So let's pray. God, we are praying, Lord, anyone here that's struggling to give you ownership of their heart, I pray that you would come and speak to their heart right now and may they give you ownership. Lord, I pray that every way that the devil has anyone here ensnared, ensnared or in, in a snare of any lie, any deception, God, that you would break that deception, that you would break any kind of self-deception, any place of shame or even uh, just hatred, unforgiveness, anything in anybody's heart here, Lord, I pray that you would reveal to them if there's a place where Satan is claiming ownership, Lord, if there's a place where they have not given you ownership, I pray, Lord, that everybody today would make a choice to give you total ownership of their heart, Lord. May there not be one, one place that you're denied access to. God, we pray that we would not treat you like a border in our lives. We would not treat you like a tenant in our lives. I pray, Lord, that we would give you full access, full control. And we thank you, Lord, that you made a way for us to be forgiven. You made a way for us to be made right with you. You made a way for us to not have to be in chains or in slavery to these different things that want to claim our life that are not from you. God, you made a way and I pray that everyone would make the choice to, to respond, Lord, to respond to whatever you want to do individually in each person's heart. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray that you would help us even to keep this sermon in our hearts and minds during the week. And for those of us that uh, need to uh, repent of anything, Lord, may, may the sermon just spark forth repentance. And Lord, anybody that you're going to bring into our lives that you want us to share some of these themes with during the week, I pray that people would remember uh, the subject matter so that it can come out during conversations. God, we give you our time right now in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so right now we're opening it up for prayer. Does anyone here have a prayer need? If you